Welcome back to Deep Source Next. I have Paul with us uh, today. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Welcome to Deep Source Next. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here. Great. Uh, so I want to start right off. Um, and the first question, I want to uh, start off with the first question. You have been around in the DevTools ecosystem for uh, quite some time now. Uh, how have you seen a change in, in the past years of when you started and, and now that you're on your second startup, second DevTools startup? Uh, second DevTools, yeah. The, um, yeah, I, I, I've been uh, sort of like through a, a couple of generations of it. I, I sort of think of um, uh, GitHub and Heroku as, as that first generation of like cloud DevTools startup um, and maybe CircleCI, which is my company in, in sort of the second generation. And I was able to track a third generation, uh, and then it just like completely lost track. It's it's uh, it's it's blown up, and there's so many uh, so many dev tools companies, and and the the space has sort of um, you know started to to overlap with you know things that that were adjacent to it before. So ops, for example, and your your last talk about like DevSecOps, it's like you know all all all, all these things are are overlapping and. Um, and it sort of expanded massively. You just see so many companies who are doing so many things, things that, that you might have regarded as like a tool or a library at some point to become a full-fledged startup. And often they're able to do much more than they would have been able to as a tool as, as a result. Um, so it's kind of combination interesting and overwhelming. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, the last one that you said, a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, there have been a lot of startups that started off not as, uh, you know, starting as a startup, but as a tool. Um, you know, it, are there any specific examples uh, in terms of from the open source community uh, that you think uh, that come to your mind? Um, I, I think Gatsby is sort of a good example of it. Um, those are, um, uh, it, it's something which, you know, started as a, as a, generator of, um, of of static pages uh, and over you know over time they, they founded a company and then it became sort of that plus Netlify sort of idea um, but all with you know all very like specifically designed for for the Gatsby stack and you know all that was only possible because of the explosion of Jamstack um, and all of that was you know something presumably led up to that I don't I don't remember the, the, the exact sequence but like that's the sort of that's the sort of explosion where, where there used to be you know kind of dev tools now there's niches within dev tools and even niches within niches right yeah yeah and I kind of like the concept of the way that you explained it and now that I think about it uh, generations of dev tools and uh, I think there is a very concrete line there's a very significant difference between these two or three generations that you talked about, like uh, you know how what GitHub is and what CircleCI is, and and mm. what uh, today's DevTools startups are, right? Like there's a very significant difference, and uh, I think uh, not just in terms of what they do, how what the tool what the tooling is, uh, but I think also in terms of how they reach out to developers. I think I think I think there is a community first approach. Uh, that probably wasn't there in the previous generations. What do you think about that? Um, well, I, I, I think the uh, maybe the most important thing is is that it, it used to be much easier. So when, um, when when Circle CI started, you know, people people were just dying for CI, and so much so that you know there, there was five or six competitors at, at the exact same time, and like fifty competitors over over sort of the life of the product. But it was just like you know you need CI here's CI. Let's sign up to do it. Um, and I, I think it I think it reflects the sort of um, uh, how things went in the like w just when the internet started taking off, you know, with you know, Google sort of got to take over the the search engine thing. Facebook became the the um, uh, the, the the social network. And then once once you had those big spaces taken, everything else had to be a niche of that. Like Twitter is like a variation of Facebook. Snapchat is a variation, of it, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see the same sort of thing, like you know. When when GitHub and and uh, Heroku started in you know, two thousand eight or something, it was around the time of this this explosion. Uh, like you know, the internet came to DevTools. Um, 
mostly for the first time. There, there wasn't really much internet or cloudification or SaaSification of, of dev tools before that. And so those companies took the very big thing. So like Heroku, you know, got the, the platform as a service thing all, all, almost entirely to its own. GitHub became the, the VCS thing, you know, second generation, the smaller pies for like CI and, and related things. Um, and so you, you go four generations on and you've got things like Dependabot, you know, like dependency management as a service, security as a service, linting as a service. Um, you know, and, and those are those are kind of like small niches and and they're um and they're interesting. But if you're if you want to build something like very big, you have to start sort of rethinking um what you know, almost where the battle lines are. And a big part of that is going to be the community that you're able to draw in and, and the um, the the sort of, um, you know, it, it's not just you set up your shop and people arrive. Now you have to really work for it and you have to build mm -hmm. um, distribution yourself to be able to, to get to the same sort of size and, and the same sort of following. And like community is like the center of that. Um, in in the current generation, it used to be you just wrote a couple of blog posts and then people had heard of you and now they used you, and it's not so easy anymore. Right? Yeah, I think building building a community kind of becomes like even if you're building, uh, you know, building building a, a, an open source project seriously, I think building a community come becomes a very vital part of maybe marketing. I don't know uh, the early GTM, so as to speak, for even an open source project. So, yeah, that mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, I want to talk a little about a little little about dark now, and it's a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, and I was very uh, uh, you know I was very you know kind of impressed with the mission statement, like making coding hundred x easier, right? And that's that's super exciting to me. Uh, also, because you know, at Deep Source, our mission is to help developers write good code. Like it's it's super mm. simple, right? Uh, so when you say making coding hundred x easier, what does that mean? Uh, mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? So I, I think it's actually related to, to what uh, I was just saying about the the explosion of technologies and the explosion of tools and companies and the the amount of things that you need to understand to be able to build software or specifically to be able to build backend cloud software. Um, you know, it, it used to be that, that that you would write some code and you you know you'd write it in Python or Ruby or you know going back a little bit PHP. Um, you'd put it on a server and now you had a website. Um, and now you know the you, know, you need to know Kubernetes, you need to know AWS, or you know, maybe one, maybe both. Um, you, you need to know Jamstack and, and JSON and REST and Thrift and, and um, you know just like more and more stuff. And the, the, the ones I mentioned are a little bit mundane, but um, you know you, you, the, there's just an explosion of, of what you need to know. And the reason that there's an explosion of what you need to know is because all the existing things that existed. Uh, didn't didn't like intersect all that well together. All the stuff that you're using today, you know, it, it has sort of um, you know imperfect join points between between them, and so you know new things are added to make it simpler to join them and to take it in a new direction and and so on. Um, and the you know to be able to to reduce that complexity, you need to remove not just the the existence or the the need to know these things, but also the the reason for these things existing. Um, and so the, the, the feeling that, that, that I had was we, we actually need to, to own the whole stack. We need to go you know, top, top to bottom uh, as much as possible. We need to own it within our thing, and then, and then we can simplify it. And so the, the approach that we took was uh, we own the programming language. We own the editor, and we own the infrastructure. And because we, we own all these things, all the we, we can take out all of these join points. So for example, there's no deployment in Dark. There's no CI CD pipeline. There's no you know, complicated uh, separate system that you need to set up. There's also no infrastructure. You don't need to provision databases, machines. You don't even need to do any of the stuff that, that, that you do with serverless of like keeping stuff warm and you know, making sure that, that, that you're um, you know that 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 you're splitting your events out appropriately. Just all of that exists in in one box, and that's what we mean by being by being simple, making it not just that it's that it's easier to do, but that many things don't even exist in the paradigm. Right, and 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 it's so fascinating when you, uh, and it, it it's actually very overwhelming when you think about it, when you're saying that you know you are combining all these paradigms into one big concept where you're just writing code. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, exactly. And, 
And if developers have access to something like that, then essentially creating, let's say, an API would just be equivalent to writing a function or defining a class yeah. and then writing a function. And that's pretty much about it. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Like the, you know, all, all that you fundamentally do in, in backends or you know, kind of in programming in general is you, you receive some data, you do some processing on it, you store it or, you know, compare it to some other bit data and, and you return something back. And all of that, like, is, you know, it's three lines of code. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, the amount of additional complexity we've layered onto it has, has just made it so much more than that. Right. So what does it mean to to when you're when you're, when you're creating a new language from scratch right so mm -hmm. essentially that's that's what you're doing and uh, i think it's much more than that because uh, you you're not just creating a language but you're also figuring out how to combine all these other things that a language is used to do you're combining that in the language right so mm -hmm. uh, what are some challenges maybe and you know uh, that you faced or what was the initial you know, the big task or whatever the initial hurdle when you're starting to write, uh, you know, create Dark uh, as a language, mm -hmm. what was your biggest challenge there? Uh, I think the biggest challenge was, was figuring out, was this actually a model that people would use? Like, is it actually possible? And everyone told us like this wasn't actually possible. Um, but I is it possible to create a language where you're editing, where, where you're coding, in production, um, like on the infrastructure, and that there's no gap between the language and the infrastructure. So in, in, in Dark, you don't really edit on your machine and push it to Git and then have a deployment step and, and that sort of thing. You, you write code it, you know, on the in the production infrastructure, and we have tools within the language and within the infrastructure to make that safe. So f feature flags being the main one, um, and and in the future some things like database migrations and, and so on being built in. And there's there's type checking and there's a certain thing about how there's no parsing, so there's no parse errors. Um, and and all of these were were designed for the specific idea of we're building this thing in production. There's lots of there's lots of things in the language about like atomically changing how the code works and all that is, is kind of behind behind the scenes. And a lot of that just just had to be invented. It didn't it didn't really exist. And so we we, we spent uh, we spent over a year of sort of experimenting with what the language would be and how it would behave and how users would interact with it uh, before we got to something that like um, that felt that felt like directionally right. And even then it took another year before we could um, maybe, maybe a year and a half, actually, before we had something that that users actually, you know, understood when they started using it for the first time. Right. Wow. Uh, right. Yeah. And um, and so going a little deeper into into talking about dark, and it's just a fascinating. I think it's a fascinating topic to talk about because. Uh, you're creating, uh, you know, languages, programming languages, and creating them. You know, the, the, it's so mm -hmm. much of design considerations that you have to do uh, because you're expecting someone to actually use it to create something, right? So one of the things that kind of uh, uh, stood out uh, to me is that you know, Dark doesn't have a textual representation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's an interesting choice. But um, I, I, why don't you? Tell us more about what does that mean. Uh, a lot of our viewer, mm -hmm. viewers might not even understand uh, because it could be a little bit technical. So, yeah. uh, for especially for the beginners. So, I have two questions. So, what does that even mean uh, to say that the language mm -hmm. does not have a textual representation? And second, what was the motivation behind making that choice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, t traditionally, the way the way a programming language works. Let's, let's just talk about Python, right? You you edit your file on you know, in, in your editor uh, or, or IDE <coughs> on your computer, and the the file is stored in in bytes, uh, or the, the the code is stored in bytes in a file, and then the Python interpreter parses that, so it takes all the all the data and it parses it into um, a a sort of like in memory representation of that. So you know, it has if you think about it in terms of OOP, it, there's, there's classes for like for loops, there's classes for classes, there's classes for objects and, and so on. So it has just like, you know, a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these things in memory and it runs through them and it says, oh, you know, I see you're doing a for loop here. Uh, I better initialize the, the thing and loop through the, the thing and do the generator, enumerator, iterator, or, you know, wh whatever is happening. That's, that's kind of how, uh, how an interpreter works. And it, it just parses the, the data uh, from disk to get there. And we just skip that parsing step. 
when you edit in the editor, you are changing the in-memory representation of the program. You are changing it so that it's, um, you know, if Dark doesn't really have four loops, but when, when, when you add, uh, you know, when, when you add a um, uh, function name, you know, the, the function name is inserted in exactly the right place in the in-memory representation of the program. Uh, and that's the thing that that's interpreted. That's the thing that we serialize to disk. That's the thing, well, we, we store it in a database. Um, and the editor is just like, working directly on that. Um, so it just skips a step. It skips a parsing step. And because there's no parser, there's no parse errors. Um, and you know, it isn't possible to, for the, for the uh, interpreter to just say, I have no idea what's going on here. You know, there's a semicolon in the wrong place. Instead, the, the errors that you get are much more contextual. And the, uh, the code, as it was before you made that error, continues to work while you're, while you're making that change. And that that's fundamentally what it's about. It's it, for us the you know it's it's not an all or nothing approach. You're editing this thing live, and so we need to keep everything uh, everything working as you're making the changes. And it's sort of like um, uh, it, it, it's all about how do we build code that is in some sense in production uh, and breaking down the barrier so that you don't need to do a deployment step and you don't need to do a big you know testing and and you know packaging and all that sort of thing that that you do in the uh in the existing world um and the the fact that the language is not just pure text is is a, an essential part of that right now oh, that's so uh, so naturally um so, uh, so a natural segue to this question would be uh then when you look for when you look at users adopting this right and, and developers, uh, you know, have been writing code that is textual, right? Mm -hmm. So, so when you made this choice, uh, uh, did you consider the difficulty, you know, if at all, that or or you know, it, it could be counterintuitive for for developers, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, people have been writing code in their IDEs, they've been using Git for version control. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. how does that fit in to you know f f to Dark here? Yeah, um, well, you, you're, you're totally right. It, it, it is counterintuitive, and that's actually what we spent the the eighteen months or the the, the three years sort of working on. We we had different uh, models of uh, of input that that felt so alien to users or to developers that that they thought you know th they would never use this, and you know they they were right. They they were difficult, um, and what we ended up doing was we ended up. Uh, we we started with a graph version of the language, so there were sort of nodes and edges, and you know nodes represented functions, edges represented the arguments to those functions, and it was all very clever and not particularly usable. Um, and we backed we backed away from that, and and we built something that's much more you know it looks and feels a little bit like code, but uh, the text editing on it felt very like. Um, like inputting a form, you know, you'd tab between boxes and you'd fill in the code in boxes, and there'd be more or less boxes. And it sort of made sense, but it, it felt very like counterintuitive to people who are used to coding. Um, and so the the final version, and this is the one that really stuck. We call this the fluid editor, um, and it's it's basically just like people typing. Um, you know, you you type actual code, um, and the if you type the same characters that you see on the screen, you will get that code, um, and it. You know, it just looks a lot like something else, but it it it's, is still you know it's still not parsed. It, it it's still the the underlying representation that you're editing. And it wasn't until we got it that close to what people are used to doing, with you know while maintaining the majority of the advantages of, of doing it the other way, uh, that we actually got people to like using it. Um, and even you know very experienced programmers were just yeah you know, their minds were boggled by, by by the old system. They just couldn't use them. Absolutely, it must be fascinating uh, to uh, to create a language from scratch. I mean, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a it's one of the things that you have to do as a developers. <laughs> like all well, of us. I, I think it's it's easy when you copy other languages. Um, so the the thing that I knew already going into the language was that uh, it it had to be an immutable language. So like like Clojure or, or, or Haskell, mm -hmm. um, and that it had to be. Uh, based on uh, on the sort of like functional paradigm, because that's the way that um, uh, that is, to my mind, the easiest way to reason about programs. Uh, and so there was a couple of languages in that paradigm that we were able to copy from uh, Elm, 
uh, in particular uh, was it was an influence. Um, and and I think that that just like made it, it, it makes it easier when you know that you're just doing the same as, as something else that already exists with, you know, some variations. At least you have a basis for it. Uh, and then the innovation that you need to do on top of that is to support what's particular about your system, which in our case is this liveness rather than to support, you know, r rather than like figuring out what, what your language is at all. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I want to change tracks a little bit and, and talk about something else uh, that I wanted to ask you. And it's kind of related to uh, what you're doing. So when you are uh, uh, doing something as Herculean, if I might, uh, as this, right? Like, mm -hmm. like yeah. right? Uh, um, how do you find developers to work on it? Like, how do you hire or, you know, what is the job description that you write uh, in an industry like, like today's? Yeah, so I, I guess the main thing is that you you're not looking for people who understand programming languages. You're not you're not right. looking for people who know how interpreters work or, or, or that sort of mm -hmm. thing. the The main thing that we actually need uh, of developers one is that they sort of like have a good full stack understanding of you know how backends and frontends work and how they work together. And that's both for understanding. Uh, our user base who are primarily building front ends, but also, you know, we have this editor and the editor is probably 70 to 80% of the work. Um, the, the back end is that, you know, it's relatively simple. Once you have an interpreter, you have an interpreter. Um, and if you need to change the language, you need to change the back end. But even when you change the language, like the front end has way more changes. We, we, we have to be able to input the data, um, show show the traces and, and, and show the, the connections to the infrastructure. That that's all in the front end, and that's that's kind of the the major part of it. So the people that we're hiring are you know just like regular full stack developers, um, and the you know sort of a, a lot of people who are interested in programming languages have, have applied, and and I think that in the general case, uh, without talking about any specifics, but in the general case. Uh, Dark is not a super interesting thing from a programming language perspective. There's not a lot of complicated things like JITs and compilers to, to be built. So much of it is, is the UX of, of how we input code and how we show results to users uh, and, and is not at all, you know, kind of cool programming language shit. Right. Right. Uh, the reason I ask this question is also because, uh, so we build static analyzers ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we hire, uh, you know, people uh, for the team, uh, developers for specifically the language engineering team, uh, it's kind of an uphill task because uh, you know it it, si it sounds very cool to work on programming languages, mm -hmm. uh, but there are very few people who have a genuine interest in static an analyzers, right? Working with ASTs and you know just mm -hmm. mangling things all day. So this well, is kind of a question. Me. That's what I did my PhD <laughs> on. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, great. Uh, so uh, talking about talking about again, uh, uh, starting uh, a, a company in developer tools. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, so uh, it, uh, again. So my previous my previous point that you know it must be an uphill task when you're building a new language and then you are uh, you know you're getting developers to use it, right? And of course, multiple iterations. Uh, but then the first thing that we talked about, the current generation of developer tooling, you need to have a community around it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so for, especially for open source developers, uh, you know, and, and, and these days a lot of creators, individual creators who are, you know, building tremendously great open source software and then trying to figure out, hey, how can we make it, how, how can you get a product out of it, right? So mm -hmm. what do you think uh, you know, someone like that should do when they want to eventually maybe transition it into being a product or maybe being a serious uh, project. Uh, you know, how do you build your first audience uh, mm. to start with? Well, it's a, yeah, that, that that that's an interesting question. The um, you know, kind kind of one of the one of the fundamental questions if you're going to turn your project into into a company um, or you know, or into a serious open source community is to to know from the start what it is that you know the value that you're providing, um, because there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of open source projects that then want to become open source based products or open core products, and that really struggle to do that transition because the value that they want to provide, such as for example hosting, 
um, is not the value that the users want because mm -hmm. perhaps they would prefer AWS to do the hosting. Um, and, and I think that they end up in, in this like really uh, challenging world because they know they want to turn it into something bigger, um, but they don't necessarily, they didn't necessarily do that initially. They didn't initially design the thing to be bigger. And so it isn't always clear to them what value they can provide to, to, to their community by, by this bigger entity. Um, and I think that that's kind of fundamentally the challenge when, when you're starting to make a community. You need to know, you know what, what is the value that you're bringing to that community in order to be able to, to pitch them. So for example, with Dark, you know, a lot of the people who have been interested in Dark are, um, are people who are you know, super into programming languages or, or something along those lines um, and who, who like maybe functional languages. But the value that we're really bringing is to people who are building front ends and who, who are building things that need APIs set up, set up relatively easily. And there, there isn't a, a massive overlap there. There, there. there is some overlap, but it's not, it's not total. Um, and we, we have really designed uh, Dark to be something that was uh, you know, sort of paid or, or, or supported, sustained perhaps, on, on a consumption basis that we would host the, the ecosystem um, and that that would pay for the sustainability of, of the thing going down the line. Um, and it isn't always clear to me that, uh, that companies and, and projects and so on have, uh, uh, are, are designing themselves around the sustainability of the value that they provide to, to, to their users. Um, and I think that that's, that that's the real challenge that, that, that people face. And especially when you have things where you know, the funding of the tool is paid for by this you know, sort of thing on the side, mm -hmm. like, like, as an example with, with, with Gatsby. You know, if, if people start to use something that isn't Gatsby, then you know, how will Gatsby, or something that isn't Gatsby, the service to host Gatsby generated static sites, um, then how will the how will Gatsby continue to evolve and grow um, if, for example, everyone else uses Netlify or something instead? And I think I think you know this is kind of what happened with Docker. You know they they produced massive value. They <clears throat> didn't um, they didn't find a way to sustainably grow that value. Um, and now the the ecosystem is sort of under threat because Docker, the company, um, is is not in a fantastic place. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, that is something that, you know, the last one that you said, uh, I mean, that is something that has happened in with a lot of projects, right? Like a lot of projects who are like super critical and, you know, everyone sees that uh, a lot of times, like uh, some very critical project that, that is a dependency for a lot of other projects mm -hmm. is now under threat because they haven't really figured out uh, the, you know, their sponsorship or their problems with sponsorship, open source mm -hmm. in general. And I think that's a larger, larger debate. But uh, quickly, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, that is something that you know I have personally been think thinking about a lot in terms of open source. A lot of our critical infrastructure, and and this is true mm -hmm. for a lot of large companies, right? Like a lot of their critical infrastructure, uh, it depends on you know one project that that is being maintained by one person who's yep. like a nomad, right? Yep. So. Uh, the open source incentivization uh, is like a, a broader topic, but uh, uh, how do you think about on the other side? Like, I want to flip the question. Like, a lot of people have talked about open source incentivization, right? And that's a broader topic. Mm -hmm. I want to flip the question and uh, talk about how a company, like how a for-profit company, right? Mm -hmm. How can they uh, kind of uh, you know mitigate that? Like, how can they de-risk mm -hmm. themselves? Uh, and I think this is something that a lot of people don't talk about proactively. Mm -hmm. like how can they de-risk themselves from something like this happening? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the question of you know how does an open source project thrive and how does a, a company de-risk it are fundamentally the same question. It's it's a right. it's a question of how does your your product or your tool become sustainable for users. And so dark, dark is, is not open source, but a lot of people have asked for Dark to be open source. And the reason that they're asking, um, for the most part, is because they're concerned that, that Dark might not be around in the future. And so right. the, you know, if, if you go fully open source, then, then that you know, 
theoretically offers some sort of some sort of solution to that. You know, you could always run it yourself, although dark is not a thing you could really run yourself. But theor theoretically, you know, someone else could run it if, if the company shuts down. Um, and so I think what, what you need to prove is, uh, is sustainability. Um, and I think that very young companies really struggle with this. Uh, when, when we started Circle CI, no one would give us their code. They would just be like, oh, we're not, we're not putting our code in, in, in you know, the cloud. And I'm like, well, it's, you're already putting GitHub. What's the difference? And it's like, well, GitHub is, you know, everyone else is using GitHub. And it wasn't until we started getting a, a bunch of big name logos on the site that everyone was like, okay. So, you know, the, the question just went away. You know, people stopped asking mm -hmm. that that it was a problem, and I think it's going to be it's going to be the same here. Nobody, you know, nobody worries that that AWS is um, is going to shut down. Um, you, even though they don't have any of the code to run, you know, their their Lambda code or or, or whatever it is, they 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 couldn't replicate uh, anything of AWS. But no one believes that AWS is going to shut down. No one believes that AWS is going to jack up the prices too significantly. Um, and but. People don't know that about younger startups. And, and so you really have to look at um, people who are willing to, or like pe people's risk appetite. Uh, you're never going to achieve uh, you know, a Fortune 500 building a critical thing on a, on a two-person startup. But what you will get is you will get you know, some people at a Fortune 500 building this side project that they just need to prototype and show it to someone, and then they're going to rebuild it themselves. Um, and and that that's sort of like the stuff that you need to focus on. You know, paying attention to people's risk risk appetites. Um, it's I mean, the, there's a whole book about this, crossing the chasm, about how you need to get the the early adopters before you get the the um, late adopters or the late majority. And and it's exactly the same for for startups in in the dev tool space. You know, build build trust with the people who can use you now. Build a story around how they use you. So for example, with Dark. We, we, we like that prototyping story. We, you know, Dark is not a tool for prototyping, but if you build your thing on Dark and you have to rewrite it in Node, let's say, for, for some reason, um, you know, you'll probably be able to, to rebuild it in Node in like a couple of days uh, at, because you did all the prototyping in Dark and that was much, much quicker. So you get the advantages um, and, you know, the, the, the cost to move off or, or the risk that you're taking isn't so high. Uh, and eventually, you know, we we will we will grow big enough and have enough users that um, that that people will will understand that they can safely do larger things, or that you know there's enough revenue coming in that they will feel that that we're sustainable and we're not that big a risk. And you know that, that that's how you move up the the value chain. Right, that makes sense. Uh, I I actually have a, another follow up, uh, and I, I think we have a couple of questions, and then we can. Uh, 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 get some get some audience questions as well. So if you're watching this live on YouTube, you can paste your questions in the chat box, and we'll get get them to Paul. Um, so uh, you know, going back to the point, right? Like when you said that, okay, uh, you know, sustainability is is uh, is is one of the primary things uh, for any any project, and de-risking for de-risking yourself. So, but as a company, and especially again, I want to go back to. Uh, you know the you know I, I kind of think it's a, it's a very it's, it's a Herculean task that you're building a language and everything around it right and mm -hmm. that's not something short term right like you can't do it in short term like you can't build uh, you know uh, something like that something like that has a scope of that huge of an impact uh, mm -hmm. can't be short term right so what is your like where do you see the 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 end of it like not end uh, i mean how do you see this in the long term like uh, mm -hmm. what is the grand vision of creating a new language and what do you expect yeah. it to be i mean th this is this is uh you know a question that that i've asked myself a lot you know during the pandemic and and you know kind of all the you know all all the all the challenges that that companies and and that our company faced around that time um, and sort of, you know, had to had to decide, you know, what what was it that I really wanted with this? Why was I why was I here? Um, and you know, I, I really realized that that this is just like a good project to work on. It's like a a enjoyable, fun thing that that I can that I can do for like a very long time. Um, and that that sort of you know realization that this you know we're, we're four years in so far. Um, and mm -hmm. and haven't quite made it to product market fit yet. You know, it might it might take us five or six years total. You know, one or two years from now to get to product market fit. Um, and you know, 
and even then that that's just when we're starting you know after that it's like you know five or ten years before we're a really big company and really making a difference and that that's just a really long story and when you look at people making programming languages it takes that long you know if you look at rust yeah. rust was started in 2006 you know python was started in 1995 uh, it takes a very long time for these things to become dominant, for these things to become um, prevalent and, and for the, their value to be really felt. So, you know, if, if you're building something like Dark, you, you really have to be in it for the for the long term. Right, of course. Yeah. And I, uh, I guess I'm just saying that you have to like, you have to accept that idea uh, in order to yeah. be able to to do that. Yeah, I think, I think that also goes for a lot of developer developer tools especially those that kind of become maybe the bedrock or not even even if not the bedrock but but deep down in in your application stack like there is some library mm -hmm. that is like super critical like i know a couple of say, say python libraries uh that have become very critical and everyone depends on them and then uh you know if, if someone goes and abandons it then it becomes a problem Right. So yeah. I think even as open source maintainers, and even if you're not building a company, it kind of becomes very important to think about, OK, what is going to happen to this mm -hmm. in the long term? And I, I, I think that's that's one of the problems with this sort of like open source burnout that that we're seeing. Like pe People talk a lot about funding for, for open source, but a lot of the time, the, the people that created these were just interested in, in building cool projects or scratching their itches yeah. or, you know, doing something for one company that they worked at years ago and they no longer work at. Um, and you know, while funding is, is definitely a, a thing that needs to be discussed and needs to be brought to, to that, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, money doesn't really solve burnout, um, you know, and you, you sort of in the open source ecosystem where you have tens of thousands of people who are relying on this thing and you never, you never really agreed to that. You were just sort of building this thing, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the burnout is going to be absolutely inevitable. And, and I think that's just something that we're going to see more and more. And the only way to avoid it is, is going to be making a, a sort of a sustainable path for, for project leaders to move, to move out of their projects um, and to allow others to, to take over. But that's not necessarily a, um, a skill set that people have when they're, when they're building you know, a cool project for the first time. They're just like writing some code. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think, I think, I think uh, a lot of people don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, don't specifically do, don't, don't explicitly do that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. as you said, like, you know, a lot of open source projects came out uh, from, you know, someone scratching their own itch and they didn't really, <laughs> when they're beginning to build this, they didn't really think of, okay, how far is this going to go? And there are so many examples of that. Right. But I think, uh, you know, uh, and when the project starts getting more and more traction, I think maintainers, or even if not the maintainers, the core creator, but maybe the early team, should start could start to think about it. That hey, okay, mm -hmm. how is it how is it going to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, there's, there's a good comparison to to how companies function. When yeah. when a startup grows big, you know, it, it's it's not just the same people doing it again. They they hire, you know, account managers and, and customer success yeah. people and uh, you know partnership teams and, and and that sort of thing. And you know, they have a lot of people whose role is not you know writing code. Um, but you know, as as open source projects grow, they tend not to to have these roles. Or if they do, they they push the engineers or the programmers on the on the project into these roles. Mm -hmm. um, and th there isn't a good um, there isn't a good history of open source projects involving people who who have other skills, who, you know, who have design skills, who have project management skills, who have marketing skills, um, and and who have community skills. And maybe the only people who did a really good job here is Rust, but I you know I, I really struggle to think of of other projects that that did kind of as well as that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I th uh, we are we are coming up on our time. I have one question. Uh, from our audience, uh, how do you pitch Dart to developers? What's the mm -hmm. aha moment for developers who are using Dart for the first time? So w when we uh, when you sign up for Dart first time, there's, there's a little tutorial that, that that sort of takes you through it. And what it does is it just has you uh, make a hello world API. So you, you know you, you you create an API handler, you type slash hello, you type the string hello world, and you make it a get handler, and that takes that takes ten seconds. And then you click a button, and it opens that page live on the internet. You know, it's a, it's an API that's or, you know it's a JSON API that returns hello world. But the whole thing is just like instant. <laughs> there's no there's no deployment. There's no setup. There's no installation of tools. 
Um, that's that's like the first real sort of like mind blowing thing where, where where people are like, oh shit, you know, we can we can do this quickly. We can do it um, without without much fuss. We can do it you know without all this. And then the second one is is when people start to build things uh, a little more, and then everything is is sort of immediate. You know, you 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 want to create a database. It's it's immediate to create a database, and you don't need to write SQL to to use it or anything. Uh, and then there's live value. We, we call them live values, but they're they're conceptually the same as traces. Uh, in your editor, anytime you make a request to an API, the uh, the value of that request is available, and it's propagated throughout the whole code. So anytime your cursor is on a is on a piece of code, you see the actual value of that expression, um, and it's sort of like this this always on debugger. Um, that you'd never had to set up and you never had to write a printf uh, or print statement for. You didn't have to set up logging or you know some logging service. Um, and I, I, I think just that that sort of like that immediacy and that liveness of understanding your program in a way that people really haven't been able to do in this sort of like separated uh, separated thing. Um, I, I, I think that's the real kind of aha moment or maybe the two aha moments that people feel when they use Dark. Great. And uh, last question before before we wrap up here, how does someone write good code in Dark? Is there a static anal anal uh, analysis tool that is there for Dark? <laughs> how does someone write good good code in Dark? I mean, it's it's interesting thinking about the relationship between statically typed functional languages and static analyzers because they they have a tendency not to have static analyzers, and I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the code is immutable, and there isn't like like when you write a static analyzer for for Java or C or you know sort of Python, you know there's a lot happening in you know in very many places, uh, and it is difficult to know what can be happening. Um, and the languages that are statically typed and or more statically typed than Java, like like you know Haskell or something, um, and that have uh, a deep level of immutability, um, they don't need the traditional kind of static analyzers. But what you end up with instead is you have a lot of little tools that work on the AST and do like small little refactorings. And it's sort of like, um, it, on the one hand, the big static analysis, there isn't as much room for it. On the other hand, the small scale static analysis is something that uh, because the languages are so regular and so little happens, they're, they're a lot more reusable and a lot easier to, to build and a lot more, people get a lot more bang for their buck by, by building you know, small little refactoring tools. Right, great. Uh... That was uh, that was great, Paul. Uh, it was great talking to you, and thanks a lot for our audience uh, for a couple of really interesting questions. Yeah, um, thanks, Alex. That was really cool. And yeah, thanks for joining, uh, Paul. Uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me.